Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for joining us to this uh, important event. I'm uh, Iwa Sukuna. I'm a uh, professor at uh, UCL, the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public uh, Policy. A quite a friend and brother of Jacob that has been given the difficult task to introduce Jacob. And before uh, introducing Jacob, let me do some formalities. That is, uh, there is no plan to fire a lamp test. Don't worry. <laughs> so, if uh, the fire alarm sounds, please follow the instruction on the announcement or follow me. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a program sheet uh, that will be taking place, and uh, the event will be live streamed. If you do not wish to be photographed or filmed, please speak with uh, the member of the staff in the back they are there. And uh, there will be QA. I hope that there will be a QA uh, after the lecture, followed by a brief reception in the space outside the uh, uh, lecture theater. And those are some of the formalities. And now it comes to the people's task. <laughs> how to introduce Jacob. And I think that the best introduction is to give the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> but let me give some three more. Jacob Mulgeta is a professor of uh, energy uh, of energy and uh, development policy at the Department of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public uh, Policy at the University College London. He co-directs the Master in uh, Public Administration in Development, Technology, Innovation, and Policy. Professor Birgheta has worked, has worked in academic and multilateral institution, institutional setting for the past 25 years, largely in the area of energy, environment, and development. He worked as an academic at the Center for Environment Strategy at the University of Surrey. He was program director of the master program, which he helped to set up in uh, 1998. Now widely regarded among the top of five programs in the UK. In addition to his academic experience, Professor Mugeta helped establish the African Climate Policy Center, we had that adventure together at the UN, UN Economic Commission for Africa, where he worked from 2010-2013 as a senior energy and climate specialist and acting director. And at the uh, African Climate Policy Center, he worked on a number of policy relevant uh, climate and development programs in uh, several countries. Professor Mulugeta's research is focused on three interconnected areas, energy systems and development, energy systems and climate change, and opportunities in the low carbon development. The confluence between the technological challenge, economic stability, ecological renewal, and social progress occupies a very fertile territory for research. His research is largely informed by Greek societal goals, and he works to bring Greece experiences into his teaching. Professor Murugeta serves as a coordinating lead author of the Energy System chapter of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change FIFA Assessment Report on Mitigation, and lead author of the IPCC State of Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degree to be completed next October. He has also been invited to participate as a lead author in the upcoming CIS assessment report of the IPCC chapter on demand, services, and social aspects of mitigation. Professor Murugeta is passionate about the critical role that research can play in increasing new conversation in climate and development. 
He was recently a member of the drafting team of African Renewable Energy Initiative, which has been set up successfully at the African Development Bank with generous funding from a group of development partners and continues to provide technical support for the initiative. And he also is embarked on the initiative of renewable energy and energy efficiency for this developed country. And this is the initiative. Professor Nilgeta's experience and interaction in various countries in Africa and uh, uh, South Asia has left a lasting impression on him about the importance of building local and national capacities, part of his vision of building transformative climate change leadership, involves the development and strong institutional institution as fun fundamental in the production of contextually relevant knowledge through the mobilization of local, national institutions, and individuals. Out of his recent engagement is a, a, one of his recent engagement is in the support of higher education institutions in African countries is in the climate impact research capacity and leadership enhancement in Sub-Saharan Africa program. He has mentored several young African scholars through his program over the past three years and has collaborated on various climate-related projects with his with this colleagues. And I can go and go on. I just want to conclude to say that uh, Professor Mungeta is investing a lot of time in the interaction between the three domains, the science, academic, the policy, and the practice domain, and interrogating, challenging the Establish knowledge systems and then to confront that to the reality, the political reality, and the practical reality. And I can go and I do have no testimonies related to his accomplishment, but as I indicated in the uh, start, his lecture is the best way of introducing <laughs> Professor Mugeta. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Yuba. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be introduced by you. But an even uh, bigger pleasure, should I say, that you are here uh, today. Um, your work on energy has, you know, over a career spanning several decades, should I say, has inspired many of us, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, questions around uh, energy development and climate issues. Um, <clears throat> it's also a great uh, pleasure and an honor for me to, uh, to give this inaugural lecture. I'm honored by all of you uh, for coming. Some of you have come from quite, uh, quite a distance away. Bradford, Manchester, Abu Dhabi, uh, Geneva, and Yuba just arrived you know, this morning uh, from, uh, from uh, New York. So I thank you all. It's also wonderful and amazing to see so many people in, you know, from different parts of uh, my, uh, my life and my work, um, from the past and present, um, work, um, study, and home as well. Um, let me thank my wife, uh, Alma, who is sitting here somewhere. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> she has been a, a co-producer of this talk as well, should I say, and my daughter Aida uh, and son Lucas, who is uh, hiding somewhere, I know, um, who are here to witness what on earth do I do every day when I come to this uh, institution. I promise their presence here is nothing to do with me, it's their own design, and so I take no blame, no responsibility for what happens to them after this lecture. So, but also thanks to uh, colleagues in, in STEEP and, uh, and other colleagues in uh, UCL. It's a great place to work. It's a great place to, to come every day um, and get inspired and uh, motivated by all the things that we try to achieve and try to, um, to do. 
Mark Johnson, where are you? Uh, thank you very much, as well as Alan. Uh, Mark, for managing this, uh, this event, and for Alan, you're doing some magical work, you know, in connecting us to the rest of the world. I also feel privileged to be at this wonderful university with a fascinating history of doing things differently. Um, it is, yes, one of the leading universities globally, and it has produced a large number of uh, no Nobel laureates. Um, many exceptional individuals have done some of their learning at UCL. Uh, just to name a few, Richard Attenborough, Alexander Graham uh, Bell, Gandhi. Uh, but this institution also has a historic association with, uh, with Africa. Uh, Sir C. Uh, Wugasur uh, Ramgulam, who was the leader of the Mauritian uh, independence movement, studied here, who later became uh, prime minister. Sir Abubakar uh, Tafawa Balewa, the first independent uh, Nigerian prime minister. Jomo Kenyatta, Kwame Nkrumah, some very formidable names. And so UCL's association with Africa runs quite deep. And Professor Ijoma Uchekbu, who's uh, sitting over there, um, who is the pro vice uh, provost for Africa and Middle East, has been working hard to strengthen this important connection. One bit of news as well uh, that I received following my appointment as professor, which uh, was a while back, in 2014, was, uh, was that I would give a, an inaugural lecture at some point. And um, after months of, uh, and years, should I say, of dodging uh, Arthur Peterson, who, uh, who's unfortunately not here. He's, uh, <laughs> he had to time this perfect, or did I time it perfectly? He's in, in Japan. And <clears throat> I mulled over what on earth to, to talk about, so I decided to settle on a subject deconstructing energy narratives and futures in, in Africa. I don't have a clue why I came with this concept, with this idea, uh, but potentially it could expose my deepest confusion and inadequacy, um, even if the subject is very much you know, related to my own uh, vocation. Of course, this is a very big subject. Uh, the immediate problem with talking about energy in the context of uh, of Africa is the danger of generalization. Um, we are talking about 54 independent countries. Um, I think I have a slide somewhere here. Uh, by the way, this is the, the outline of the, the, the talk, you know, um, where I will set the context, you know, which is what I'm doing right now. And then, you know, I'll map out the narratives and some of the issues emerging out of that. And I will say a little bit about the ARI program initiative that uh, uh, Yuba and I had been involved with. So this is the, the continent that I'm dealing with. And as you can see, it's, it is a pretty vast area. You know, you're talking about United States, India, Western Europe, China, Mexico, Iberia, that's uh, Spain and Portugal, all wrapped into, uh, and Japan as well. So large area with something like, you know, 1,500, 2,000 languages, plus some who are Francophone, some Anglophone, Lusophone, that's Portuguese speaking, and a variety of ecological zones represented, climates, rural, urban, very complex part of our world with a billion inhabitants. So this immediately suggests that any lecture that broadly talks about Africa will run the risk of obscuring the complexity um, and the diversity of this uh, continent. So I will blame my oversimplification because I only have one hour to talk. The second problem of take, talking about Africa is um, the fast changing narrative or image of, of Africa, by, particularly by external observers. As you can see in 2000, the year 2000, um, the Economist front page referred to Africa as the hopeless continent. Fast forward 2011, 10 years later, we have a very different image, different impression of, uh, of Africa, which is Africa rising. Telling us it's no longer a hopeless part of the world. In fact, in 2011, uh, this is a year that represented one of the few regions where the wrath of the global 
financial crisis um, was not having its full-blown effect. So roll forward a couple of years. Africa is aspiring. So there are some very positive stories coming out. Um, and so this is a challenge because there are some images or there are some impressions you know, that are uh, very difficult you know, to grasp. But nonetheless, you know, what we have seen is that over the past um, decade, Genuinely, real income per person jumped 30% after shrinking by 10% in the preceding 20 years. So there is a sustained progress that we are seeing. Quite a lot in terms of innovation as well. I mean, you've heard about you know, Kenyans using mobile money transfers, which allow something in the order of 23 billion US dollars to be transferred via uh, mobile uh, um, uh, telephones. So this is fueling new innovations to emerge and a rising entrepreneurship as well. But above all, new hopes across many countries. Now to set a slightly different context, it doesn't mean, of course, that Africa is out of the woods. <clears throat> there are still conflicts, some conflicts, less so than in the past. Um, new types of violent confrontations that are claiming large victims, large numbers of lives, um, and the specter of poverty still looms large. The UNDP indicates um, that inequality is on the rise across Africa, even though we are experiencing, we are seeing economic uh, growth in, in the aggregate, but the way in which you know, that is distributed um, has some challenges. And part of the story is that even though, yes, we've seen those high uh, growth, Part of the story is that this, you know, structural uh, transformation has not happened. By this, what, we, what do we mean? We mean the reallocation of economic activity across uh, the broad sectors of agriculture, manufacturing, and services. This hasn't yet happened, or it is uh, slow for it to happen. Um, whatever growth has been experienced, much of it has not delivered the the jobs that are needed. Uh, some would even argue that Africa has missed the boat of industrialization, but this is a, an ongoing discussion. Or at least it will need to invent different ways of, uh, of growing. So there is quite a robust conversation about what pathway Africa should be embarking on. But this needs to be settled quite, quite fast. For Africa, this needs to happen quick. Youth unemployment is one of those indicators that frightens the heck out of politicians. The heck, I was going to use some other word, but uh, I thought, you know, we are in uh, um, uh, you know, genteel type of uh, an environment. And rightly so, too. Politicians should be uh, scared and frightened. And, and we've seen some shakeups are happening in, in different parts of Africa with young people rising and demanding change. Um, <clears throat> but you might, you, by now you must be wondering, what on earth is he talking about? What, what does this mean? What's got this to do with, uh, uh, with energy? Uh, here is an interesting uh, photo taken by, by Alma somewhere in Ethiopia. Just two people looking into the uh, horizon and wondering what on earth is going on. Well, the simple answer for me is that uh, reliable and affordable energy is necessary for sustaining economic uh, growth and meeting the social needs. This is the, the crux of it. So far what we have talked about is that economic or structural transformation has not happened, that jobs have not been created, etc., etc. but the, econom the economies are, are growing. The challenge though is that you need energy to fuel this activity. So the anxiety over energy is not new. Uh, historically we've seen this, you know, Lenin, Roosevelt recognized the centrality of energy for transformation. Whether energy comes from hydro, uh, fossils, nuclear, for the end user it does not really matter. What the end user is interested in is the services that energy provides. And this is exactly the kind of demands that Africans would have. So when a country, a large country, uh, a country has large coal reserves, do you blame that country for wishing to use this resource? No, you can't. 
after all, you know, in fact, we were talking just moments ago that Senegal has recently discovered quite a lot of oil, offshore oil and, and coal. So the debate now in Senegal is, well, ask me, why should I go in the, in the renewable direction? But this is an ongoing, uh, an ongoing discussion. Now, I'm going to try and make a slightly different pitch uh, to this. Um, I think, you know, the world is somewhat um, different today than where it was in the past, you know, how uh, countries have devel developed and industrialized. So the old way of generating uh, energy and using energy uh, has been associated to a whole host of externalities that we know of ecological as well as social. And this is presenting uh, to the global community its own kind of ex existential threat. So hence, you know, this uh, snake eating itself. Uh, and I was looking in, the, in, in, in Google for, for, for something like this because this is the, the, the image that came to my mind. And uh, th there is some gruesome stuff out there. Eh? Uh, <laughs> I mean, this, this stuff really happens, this kind of stuff. Uh, in his uh, Social Costs of Private Enterprise, William Cope, 1950, wrote that externalities are not so much market failures as cost-shifting successes. To argue that substantial proportions of the actual costs of production are ultimately borne by third persons or by the community as a whole. So somewhere in this world, environmental burdens are disproportionately shouldered by some people, often the poor and powerless. The central issue here is of sustainable development is not about shifting burdens, but rather reducing the burdens and distributing those burdens <laughs> equitably. And uh, I mean, this is a, a bit of a crazy uh, argument. How do you distribute burdens equitably? Well, quite a number of, quite a, a large proportion of the world's population actually shoulders quite a lot of the, the impact associated with uh, the, uh, our own energy systems, the way in which you know, it has evolved in the past. So setting the context, and here is a, some work that we've done at, uh, at uh, the ECA with Yuba and, uh, and various other colleagues. Um, um, some more stuff on uh, household cooking, which I will uh, briefly touch on. Um, in Africa, when the topic of energy is picked up, quite often a number of other words accompany it. Here we're talking about access, poverty, development, services, unserved, crisis, business models, transformation, transition, renewable, low carbon, security, the list goes on. Um, what each of these are trying to express is that the conversation around energy is complex and contested and shows that energy issues cross boundaries and policy domains. So energy issues across Sub-Saharan Africa are inherently complex, largely due to the dual nature of the energy system itself, where traditional and modern energy systems and practices coexist. And this is something that we, uh, we explored in, in this widening energy access uh, paper a few years back. Um, now, if you look at the, the total generation capacity of the 48 sub-Saharan African countries, excluding South Africa, that stands at roughly about 31 gigawatts. Um, those of you who may not make much sense of these uh, numbers, um, while each person in Europe or North America uses 11,000 kilowatt hours per year on average, a person in sub-Saharan Africa uses 137. So that gives you the kind of difference, the scale of the difference that we're talking about. Um, something in, in, in order of 70% of the total population does, lives without an, uh, electricity access. Um, and the problem is quite dynamic as well, changing. International Energy Agency calculates that since 2000, the year 2000, the number of people without access to electricity has increased in 37 countries. Part of it is highlighted by the fact that any effort in widening energy access must take into account demographic changes that are also taking place on the ground. 
Beyond electricity, of course, we are also we see that the challenge is also extends to solid biomass, which includes wood, charcoal, animal dung, and, and crop waste, which are the primary um, sources of energy for cooking and heating for nearly 730 million people. The high reliance on traditional use of uh, solid biomass has got its own repercussions, implications, deforestation, and ultimately also um, greenhouse gas emissions. But this, I think, is a, a really critical challenge. And we covered this in some of the work that we did with Adisa and uh, Haruna um, in, in Nigeria. But this extends beyond Nigeria into uh, so many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. I fear, though, that this is a critical area which deserves much bigger attention than, than this conversation here. So most of my examples, the following examples, are going to be from the power sector, mostly, uh, which isn't by no means you know, to try and diminish the value of, of this energy challenge, the cooking challenge. Uh, on the contrary, it is too important to just shoehorn into a broader discussion around, uh, around energy. One other caveat, um, when we, we can no longer talk about energy in isolation from climate change. So those of us who have been involved in the IPCC, it's always an ongoing discussion. I was part of the, the energy uh, chapter, and so energy is central to the discussion around uh, and climate change. <clears throat> Sometimes the concern is with the implications of rising greenhouse gas emissions on human and ecosystems or future generations. Here I'm talking about the climate uh, discussion. Sometimes it is directed at the financial cost of certain decarbonization actions and who should pay for it or of innovation systems that would lead to allowing desirable outcomes. Other times it's about what happens to economies under conditions of deep decarbonization. This is a concern that countries, particularly oil producing countries, are raising. What happens? Or how lifestyles would need to change to ensure consumption levels are under control to avoid punching through the, uh, the two, th two degree centigrade ceiling. Or right now, 1.5 degree centigrade target. And the possibility of failing to limit global warming to below 2 degrees centigrade or 1.5 degrees centigrade, um, what happens then? Then what? I think this is a real a serious dilemma that as a global community we're contending with. <coughs> but coming back to Africa, a lot of, it's also worth highlighting here that a lot of the scientific conversation that's taking place um, it, it has very little input, I, I should say, little input from African institutions, and that's a fact. And this is something that we have been dealing with at the Africa Climate Policy Center. For example, there are few climate modelers and integrated assessment uh, modelers from Africa who can place on the table some of the critical issues that are relevant for the continent and specific countries. There aren't. Africa is effectively absent from the altar where the science is being discussed. And so how do you expect that if you are absent that you would be able to roll some of those scientific findings to be able to support your policies and your negotiations in the climate negotiations that is. And yet of course there is an irony in all this. Uh, the consequences of climate impacts on ecosystems will affect Africans disproportionately as the cost of adaptation could be significant and the decarbonization costs are likely to be considerable on people whose contribution to climate change has been relatively small. The legitimate calls for appropriate compensation that Chucks, for instance, would, would argue for uh, loses the livelihood uh, sorry, ecosystem losses and livelihood affected are now just echoes, drowned by the noise and seemingly compelling logic of market-based solutions. And here is a, 
a, a, a, a sense which I will, uh, I will come back to. Um, so on this issue, African governments have failed to engage on the politics, failed to build credible knowledge institutions and failed to mobilize citizens to take interest, much less take action. There are some exceptions. Countries such as Ethiopia, such as Rwanda, who are attempting against all odds to mainstream their national climate strategies into line ministries um, with some success. It's very difficult because these are costly uh, interventions. How do you have you know, a country that is trying to grow the, the, the economy at double digit, 10, 12 deg uh, percent, at the same time wanting to, to, uh, to keep em uh, emissions you know, to zero growth? That's a serious challenge. There aren't that many countries out there who are actually presenting you know, this level of uh, ambition. But still the world meets annually to remind itself that climate change is here to stay. So we now have the nationally determined contributions committing nation states to specific uh, emissions reductions. Um, but as you can see, the gap between the, the baseline or even the current policy trajectory and where things should be, where we should be, is quite vast. So we are looking at a scenario of three to four degrees centigrade rise in terms of temperature. So all this discussion underlines, I think, the vital position energy ought to occupy in the development and climate conversations in Africa. So there is a general agreement on the destination. The challenge is on the pathway that countries and communities take and how they balance the associated environmental, social and environmental um, costs. Energy, as you can see in Africa, is a, is a big topic. Um, but let, let me narrow down a little bit so that I can come to the narratives. Let us therefore narrow the focus and agree on some common principles. We've discussed a moment ago that there is a widespread agreement that the future of our energy system should be fairer, cheaper, cleaner, and climate friendly. This means a completely new direction than the one traveled so far by others. So we are really looking at um, energy systems that, are, that fall in line within the SDGs, energy systems that uh, are not going to do this, which is, I mean, this is an, an example in China, and that one over there is in, uh, in India, where groundwater resources are being depleted at a, at a pretty rapid rate as a result of uh, um, water extraction historically, for agricultural development. Um, <clears throat> but for this, of course, policies matter, and the governance matters, context also matters. Uh, we may agree or disagree with those you know, who may have a, a different view about um, whether you know, human uh, interference causes climate change or not, but nonetheless, let's leave that aside. Um, what we have is, even within the sustainable development vision, there are contested uh, perspectives. Um, and to some extent, it, it falls in line within the, the different types of narratives that I'm about to, um, to discuss. Before going into some detail though, you may, you may ask why explore energy transitions or energy questions in Africa in terms of narratives. Well, firstly, I have long been interested by the idea of power and development of knowledge systems and why some actors have more capacity and more agency to influence these processes than others. One person that comes to mind is Edward Said, whose work, the critique of Orientalism, was an early influence in that his notion of uh, imaginative geographies in which the, the West, the Occident, and the Orient, the East, are separated. And, represented, and representations of the world are produced by Orientalist discourses. So discourse matters uh, that serve powerful political uh, instrument of domination. Another is 
a person by the name Antonio Gramsci, his thesis on the construction of hegemony by dominant groups propagated through values and norms that legitimize it and accept it as common sense, which continues to be influential in our discussions about power and institutions. Another influence is the work of Ugandan Mahmoud Mamdani around the politics of uh, knowledge production. Mamdani's, Mamdani talks about the need to raise the intellectual confidence and substance among Africans and their institutions to create their own concepts and come up with the answers that address the questions they themselves generated. Mamdani warns that the status quo will continue to disappoint because the understanding of the problem is not rooted at home, but imported from outside. And here is also a, an interesting influence by Professor Okereke, his book called Homegrown Development, which is in, in line with that uh, perspective. The second reason for discussing uh, narratives is that questions around who are the key actors, whose agenda matters, who sets the agenda and how and where the knowledge is produced are reinforced further when I joined the African Climate Policy Center. There, what I began to see was in, in full glare, glaring de daylight how policy is processed and negotiated and implemented. Um, and, and I began to be much more interested you know, about the, the narratives and therefore you know, that uh, is another um, uh, reason. Now let me go to the specific narratives. The first one is the state-led, uh, where states, states, states play a vital role in promoting and implementing energy infrastructure. And here you know, we really are talking about <clears throat> development for transformation, <clears throat> development for, um, uh, for economic development and growth. It is, this, this narrative tends to be technology agnostic. For example, you know, you have examples in Tanzania where coal is uh, in, in found in, in uh, plentiful. South Africa coal. Ethiopia has the combination of uh, uh, hydro and geothermal. Mozambique has hydro. But the issue here is, is that the argument of this uh, state-led narrative is that markets are not independent of uh, societies, that markets are actually socially embedded. And, <clears throat> and the, the, the critical issue here is how you use energy systems in order to, to, to transform your economy, in order to be able to, to build your industrial uh, uh, base and, and so forth. And of course, the experience of, uh, the, the, the Asian experience provides a, uh, a working uh, principle, as it were. China, for instance, is very present across, uh, across Africa in terms of supporting energy infrastructures and, uh, and so forth by providing cheap loans, for example. The second narrative is the market-led. And this is a, uh, of course, sometimes, you know, this, these are operating uh, side by side. And here the argument is that, you know, Africa, in Africa you have a, uh, a tendency for, for, market, for markets to fail. Um, because you know, the pricing and property rights uh, regime are not quite uh, well adjusted. Um, so the early in the early days of the, in the 90s or so, the move was towards st the state you know, to deregulate. Um, and gradually what we saw was a, uh, across you know, Asia and across Latin America, quite a lot of uh, privatization and deregulation was taking place, but not so much in, uh, in, in Africa. This market-led also principle argues for a, a political. In other words, let's strip out you know, the politics from, from our uh, decisions. Um, but there is an, an assumption built into this. One assumption, or perhaps some would argue is a reality, is that Africa is high risk in terms of in, for investors. It's high risk because uh, the, the returns that would be expected are not at the same level as uh, what would be the investment. 
And the problem here, of course, is that you know, concessionary funds are not, no longer available for many countries. This is you know, uh, loans, in, uh, cheap, cheap loans. And the move towards the, uh, the private sector is, is very much you know, curtailed as far as the, uh, the state is, uh, is concerned. So, I mean, in terms of the, the, the influencers of this, you could see that uh, um, both, you know, if you look at the state-led and, and the market-led, um, central government has a great influence, especially when you're talking about, you know, state-led uh, narratives. And, and, of course, as you move into the market-led, then, you know, you begin to obviously see the, the private sector, uh, both international and multilateral uh, agencies playing a much bigger role in influencing uh, policy and, uh, and decisions. Um, then there's a third narrative, which is the, uh, the climate-led. Uh, how long do I have, Yuba? Where are you? I'm here. Yeah. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll run quickly so that we have a little bit of time for discussion. The climate-led, this is a new phenomenon into the picture. And this is the argument, the narrative that argues for ecological limits are, are fundamental, that we have to adhere to those. Um, it comes, you know, with its own global consensus. And Africa needs to move beyond, beyond the historic responsibility argument and take a much more of a proactive position. This narrative problematizes. It challenges hydrocarbons from a practical and futures perspective. The argument here is that it makes no sense for Africa to continue on the same path as what others have are gradually abandoning. The policy choice here uh, to be made then is shaping the energy system of the future. It has to be different you know, from the way that it looked in the past. Um, and, and, and countries should see this narrative, should see this uh, uh, principle as an opportunity. And here, examples again are plentiful. You know, Ethiopia, I come back to that example, uh, which is beginning to use quite a lot of its uh, uh, hydro energy, as well as geothermal and wind, and is, is, can be uh, uh, classified as an interesting example of this. The final one is the cooperative or citizen-led. Now, this one is an argument, the narrative that <clears throat> accepts neither the state nor, <clears throat> nor the market. Because uh, <clears throat> the argument here is that these two entities actually serve the interest of minorities and elites, and therefore there has to be a different conversation around energy. And who controls energy assets um, actually matters, is the, um, the, the position of the citizen-led cooperative type of uh, a narrative. Um, and there are, within this diverse possibilities um, and the argument being that you know we need to be closer to where the the, the solutions need to be closer to where the, the problems really are hence you know democratizing decisions now of course this isn't a a particularly easy uh, uh, position um, because it takes considerable time and commitment and effort uh, you know to, to be able to make uh, cooperatives work. It has been, a, you know, a very challenging uh, process, particularly when you're talking about energy systems. So I think um, uh, th th ultimately, though, the issue is um, that in each, in a single country, a combination of these different narratives exist or may exist. Certainly the, the market-led and the state-led narratives exist. You've got different uh, players, both in nationally and internationally, adhering to these perspectives. Um, you have a growing chorus of uh, those who argue that you know, the climate needs to be taken much more seriously, uh, who, who, who push that, uh, that particular agenda. Now, these guys sometimes you know, may, may form a coalition with others within other, um, call it you know, narrative categories, such as state-led, for example. Um, and then the fourth one is the alternative narrative. That's the one that's still yet to be developed, yet to emerge as a, as a force. And yet, you know, when we look at the way in which technologies have evolved, 
the way in which you know, markets are evolving, um, there is a possibility that the cooperative model could actually work so long as you, know, you get the, the politics right and, um, uh, 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 and, and, and so forth. So let me just, Yuba wants me to, uh, to stop. Just a quick uh, you know, uh, discussion around the uh, ARI. This is an initiative, the Africa Renewable Energy Initiative that we had been involved with. And it's, it is an interesting uh, model because it was uh, initiated by the uh, United Nations Environment Program following a, uh, uh, the submission of the African uh, group of negotiators. Um, they submitted you know, their formal document you know, to, to try and encourage you know, the, that there has to be an investment in transforming energy systems. So UNEP you know, latched on this possibility, this opportunity, to try and open up a new discussion in, in, in Africa. And initially it called it the Africa 2020 Access to Renewables Initiative. And um, so a few of us were called in. Yuba was leading this, uh, this process. And what, what emerged was that at the beginning, there were multiple narratives, even within the team that was pulled together. Some were pushing a more inter entrepreneurial type of uh, uh, line. Others were, you know, holding on to, well, uh, you know, the state has to be the driver. Others were saying, hang on, you know, they all have failed, you know, the bottom-up type of uh, initiative is the one that actually has not been tested and needs to be developed, and it fits into the, uh, the African model, as it were. And so we spent, uh, on and off, over a period of two years or so, uh, developing this framework, and, uh, of course, Yuba mentioned it earlier. It has been developed. It is part of a program within the African Development Bank and um, up and running. Many challenges. The biggest challenge, of course, were that, you know, that there are so many voices, that, you know, both internal and external. How do you make these talk to each other? How do you create you know, the types of alliances that actually help um, such programs to, to have any... Uh, any traction at all. And um, maybe this is something you know, we can discuss at a, uh, in a Q&A uh, way. But a, a, a large part of this was really to highlight you know, certain principles. The first one that we insisted on was country ownership. We hear about country ownership from all sorts of initiatives. But really country ownership, what we've seen is it means, well, we, we work together, but we will take it and then we will work it for you and hand it over, that you, we, which would be classified as country ownership. What we insisted on was that the countries themselves need to actually have a, a robust discussion internally to be able to generate, to understand you know, their own problems and begin to come up with the solutions that actually meet the country's needs. So we were playing with, you know, with very different approaches and even redefining you know, what is meant by some of these concepts. These are nothing, they're, they're not new. They're, they've always been there. It's a question of how do you frame these, um, uh, these arguments, these definitions, um, and in order to be able to push towards a more sustainable energy uh, program. And so, you know, we have this program. It has had its own political challenges, but... Uh, um, we'll see where, where, where it leads us. I'll stop there so that, you know, we can have uh, some discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Muligeta. You know, I'm right. I did not finish my uh, initial talk, and I said that let us give the laptop talking.